everyone. I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Amy Eisner. I'm the Adult Program Engagement Manager, Manager at the JCC Greater Boston and Newton. We are thrilled to partner with the Pucker Gallery for this special Culture Club presentation as we explore a journey through modern times, the art of Samuel Bach. This event will feature a retrospective of his work as well as a focus on his newest pieces, which is on view at the Pucker Gallery in Boston until April 24th. Joining our discussion today from the Pucker Gallery is Gallery Director Bernie Pucker. Also joining us is Rose Montera, the Coordinator of Education and Community Programs like this one here today. Also joining the conversation will be Professor Gary Phillips of Wabash College. He's the author and editor of 11 books and more than 70 articles, and his most recent book focuses on the artwork of Samuel Bach. We'll also be joined by Mr. Bach himself. He will share his evolution as an artist and his continued exploration of the questions of our moral responsibility to repair the world. If you have questions for anyone here, I encourage you to write them in the chat and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Now I'll hand it over to Mr. Pucker, who will take it from here. Bernie. Amy, nice seeing you. Nice meeting you actually this way. And also Thank nice you. having an opportunity to share the works, at least virtually, of Sam's um, and do it in a slightly different way than we have up until now, this being a more retrospective view and journey through his art and in many ways through the 20th and now 21st centuries um, with an enhanced awareness of the difficulties of the world in which we live highlighted by the Ukraine. Um, just as background, Sam and I have worked together for close to 54 years, which means that each of us are just slightly over 54. <laughs> and we've worked together with Gary for oh so many years uh, at Wabash, he's edited and also written a number of books on Sam's work, including one recently called Just Is, another on the icon of loss. And we'll, I think, touch upon some of these images during the conversation today. So we're calling it a journey through modern times, the art of Samuel Bach. Um, it seems to me it's a fair beginning with the uh, earliest painting we presently have in the gallery, I think called 3210. Um, and let's see if we can look at that, Rose, begin with that. Um, and uh, we will hopefully be able to move back and forth from the images, as you can see them now singly on the canvas. We recently had a visit from the folks who have constructed the catalog raisonne of Sam's work. They live in Dusseldorf and have now recorded well over 9,000 works which are available uh, through the internet and through the website of the uh, catalog raison of Samuel Bach. This is a relatively early painting and a major painting. And um, it's been in our collection, it's been sold, it's back in our collection again. And I would ask Sam if he would begin by remembering the painting and sharing with us. Well, uh... I painted this painting in uh, 68, 69. So this was uh, in a certain way uh, close to the uh, year that uh, followed a, a war of uh, uh, six days. And um, this was when I uh, have uh, in some way put aside um, much more abstract, much more so-called contemporary art and try to um, focus very much on the expression of what was going on in my head and communicate with people in, in a style and in a concept of time that was very familiar. And as you can see in this painting, it is very much related to the um, 17th, 18th century Dutch still life painting. But uh, of course, the three, two, one, zero is the departure of a rocket. And if you look well between the bottles and the very domestic uh, arrangement of things on a table, which has already had to go through a tikkun, you can see the nails and so on, there is something that erupts again that is sent into the sky that maybe will be uh, sent to. Um, 
destroy something again, like uh, this incredible possibility of tikkun that Mr. Putin is enabling uh, us now by uh, creating this frightening and tragic destruction that he uh, does. So uh, unfortunately, as King Solomon said, there is nothing new under the um, uh, sun. And um, this brings us back and brings us very much forward in time. Gary, do you have some thoughts about this painting? Yeah, so I, I constantly am, am struck by the titles that Sam uses, and also that the theme here of a still life, when it uh, has a certain kind of ironic character about it, it's uh, still death. And the play upon it's still being death uh, that's being proposed through the, the symbols here and the images that uh, of rocketry and of uh, death that's implicit. I mean, the thing that a bomb does and a rocket does is it, it it waits to be exploded. And so it's still doing that. So my question, uh, Sam, uh, is is uh, to you is how how does this still uh, life, still death work as a ongoing uh, theme for you as you as you look at uh, the contemporary world through eyes that uh, have experienced this directly yourself in personal ways? Well, you know, uh, artists today have these enormous possibilities uh, that they never had before. Uh, artists today um, can uh, speak in, in shapes, can, sp can speak in content, can um, do not have to serve as an illustration of certain religious matters and so on. So for me, what was very important always was to look at the world in which um, I live, to absorb it, to absorb the events, to think what I, what, what I think about it, and to wake up the people, not only to look, but to see and, um, and to think, to see and to think. And therefore, um, my entire work, my entire work has always been very much um, pushed forward by this need. So I see here this painting that I painted uh, uh, so many years ago, uh, maybe half a century, more than half a century ago. And actually, I feel that nothing has changed that much in the world or in me personally, in my need also to do my art. So, so I would, oh, sorry, go ahead, right. No, you, you finish up. Okay. So so in, in what if that's if that's the case, in what way then is Tukun uh alive and well in the uh in the image or in the experience of the viewer looking at the image? Well, you know, uh, the tikkun is a Kabbalistic concept of uh, repairing the, the vessels and so on. But I think that it is an instinct in every human being to repair, to repair mm -hmm. something. And I think that uh, repairs have also their limitations. Um, I mean, we know very well that we can never reconstruct something that was destroyed the way it was before it was destroyed. And yet we try. Uh, for me personally, it is very much uh, um, the, I would almost say sad and uh, tragic experience of having lived among survivors, having lived among people where uh, uh, a man who has lost his uh, wife and children and the woman that has uh, lost uh, her husband and so on, they have remarried after the war, they tried to come back to some reality. They tried sometimes to have children and even not to tell to the children anything of the horrors that happened before, just live in a kind of a normal world and, and try to repair with it somehow life. And, and most of the people, of course, succeeded, but in a limited way. There were always some things that were not exactly the same because mm -hmm. it, a, 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 a total tikkun is only possible intellectually, intellectually. <laughs> only as a desire for something, mm -hmm. but in reality you cannot do that. And we know through the enormous problems that the second generation or the third generation of survivors had, that tikkun 
that was affected uh, was not always uh, working. And therefore, um, I, uh, I think that in what you see in my paintings is always some bits and pieces of something that was, that serve in order to evoke something that seems to recall or, 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 or bring back to memory things that existed, but they are never complete. They are never really the way they were because also because our memory is always very selective. Also, our memory is also made out of bits and pieces that come together and, and are a recreation every, every time. So mm -hmm. this is, these are the things between which I navigate. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue of repair is that in almost all of your paintings, there is an indication as where the repair has taken place. In other words, we live with trauma, we live with brokenness, and yet we go on, but we're not what we were before. The notion of being perfect no longer ever existed, but certainly doesn't exist in these days and age. So what I wanted to go to instead of other of your images, Sam, was a favorite artist of mine, and I think of yours, um, in relation to this particular painting. Um, and just ask you for a minute to take a breath and look at a very beautiful painting of Morandi. And if you can, to both compare and contrast that this still life with uh, your still life. And it's wonderful to have them side by each, especially with the box with the oval on it. <laughs> well, you, uh, uh, well, for me, Morandi was a, a great <laughs> teacher in terms of how to distribute things and, and, and weights and so on in um, a given space. Well, uh, for me as a painter, of course, Morandi is absolutely extraordinary in the way that he deals with shapes. When you look at this, it is just a description of very simple objects on a, on a table, but they are all uh, represented by flat shapes almost. And look, for instance, there is a, there is a little box with a, um, a label on it, and the label connects to the background, which is behind the vase, the brown vase there. And, and our eye completes the, 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 the little patch there, which, which is his creative way of dealing in shapes and creating a, a fantastic sense of balance. Uh, the, the, the desire of the still life of representing stillness. But at the same time, uh, this thing is, is an aesthetic, is a very aesthetic and also I, I would say atmospheric uh, mm -hmm. experience watching, but it certainly does not speak so much of the, of the problem of its time. So I, I could not get away from the problems of my time. I am, I am a, a social being, I am, I, I am a political being, I am of the, uh, the kind of people that when, uh, when um, I am being told, well, let's take off everything, but not of politics. And I say, I'm sorry, then we don't have anything to talk about because we are political beings and we live in a world that is made of so many choices. So. Uh, Morandi is, 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 is an extraordinary artist, but he's, he's, he's a very much an artist artist. I mean, art comes from art, has always been coming from art, but Morandi kept it in the sphere, in the limits of art, and I'm trying to push my art a little into other domains. The notion of doing both uh, the balance of the painting itself, the form, the texture, and the color, and the content is what you're really referring to. Yeah. And in this case, the content is humanity, humanness, inhumanity, and bestiality. And so as we go through some of the images, I think that we'll be back to your um, center of interest personally. Um, the next image that we're going to look at is a very meaningful one um, at this point, because on the 16th of March, 2021, this painting was hung in the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston as a recent acquisition of this museum. Uh, there is a long history 
uh, that we won't go into in terms of the Museum of Fine Arts and the reasons for it now being there. But now that it is there, if anyone in the city has the time to go into the lower rotunda, it is on a single wall by itself. And it speaks of all the things that Sam's work over these seven, almost eight decades continues to uh, present for us to engage with. Gary, I'm gonna ask you first, since um, I, don't, I, don't, I may have sent this to you recently, but I do want your response to it um, and what it says uh, to you personally. Well, as you know, as I think about the composition, um, it's, it's hard not to see both solidity and holes every place, right? Wherever you look, uh, holes on the top in the Star of David, holes that have been filled presumably on the frontis of, the, of uh, the, the houses with bricks in the windows, presumably closing up space. So I'm struck as, the, uh, as a series of opens, openings and closings. And then I think metaphorically about what that means about uh, what it means to live in a space where everything has been closed in or closed out. And uh, what what it means, therefore, to live in an alternative way, and and that that sense of um, both a solidity and and uh, rupture seems, in my mind, to, to to mark both my experience of the of the image, but also my experience of what I what I read in the news today about uh, about these refugees uh, from Ukraine. Uh, but also refugees on our, on the U.S. borders as well. So it, it speaks to me, I think, uh, of of a continuing modern experience that uh, that is uh, quite unsettling. Sam, yes. Well, um, I painted this painting in New York in '76. I painted a series of paintings that had to do with. Uh, symbols, icons of, um, of, 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 of uh, Judaism. And this painting for me was uh, certainly in, in a certain way a memory of uh, my birth town of Vilna or Vilnius as it is called today. And of my sense of being buried there in these sudden ancient streets that created the ghetto into which we were all thrown in the entire Jewish um, community was packed uh, about 70,000 people were packed into these small seven streets where once hardly 3,000 people lived. And um, little by little, the population was uh, murdered and, uh, and we got to about 20,000 that somehow managed to survive in these little streets. And I myself felt that I'm in a hole, the hole here is of course the shape of the yellow star that we had to wear on our bodies. And it felt to me as if the rest of the, uh, of what is outside, it turned into stone. Um, just does not look at the suffering that goes in in the, in the hole. It is indifferent, it is indifferent. Of course, this does not speak of all the cases and of all the individual efforts of certain of the Lithuanians who uh, helped, who, who uh, have also uh, sometimes risked their own lives, like like uh, uh, the, the the priest and the nun and um, the Lithuanian engineer that saved us a group of um, twelve people by risking uh, their life. And I always rem uh, remained asking myself, would I have had in a similar uh, situation, the courage to do that. I mean, these are th these these aren't questions that that one can answer easily. You have really to find yourself in a certain situation to know, like the today's uh, uh, president uh, of Ukraine, who who discovers himself suddenly as a leader, and and just a few months ago, no one gave him the credit to to have this personality. So there is. There is something very dramatic going on, and 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 and, and this specific painting I really painted. Also, when I painted it, I, I because of Vilna, because of the hole, because of my um, 
uh, murdered grandparents and so on. Uh, I painted it with a lot of, of heart. And this is also why I kept it for, <laughs> with me for over 40 uh, years before I gave it away because I think that it is after all fantastic when a painting is being seen by a public because when a painting is not being looked at it, <laughs> it doesn't even exist. So, um, uh, so here, here is my little input about this. Um, well, there's this wonderful quote of Brother Thomas's, which I go to many times, which is the art is not complete until it is shared with others. Yeah. And it's a perfect description of this piece. The longer I look at the painting, we saw it on Sunday together with the chief curator, Frederick Gilchman, at the MFA, and felt a sense of, I think, genuine pride and pleasure that this work was now being seen and experienced in such a public space in Boston. At the same time, what it deals with is the, again, destruction of life itself, but without human beings portrayed in it, the absence of the people who have been imposed upon, who have been destroyed, who have been killed. CNN today and the news media brings us directly into the acts of atrocity that are going on um, by Russia, by Putin at this point. And it really brings us, I think, to the next painting in a very special way. The family, which, as Sam can certainly tell you, its history is for me, and I think for all who ever see the painting here in the gallery and eventually in a museum, um, encounter so many feelings for themselves. We have it on a sliding panel. Frequently, when people come to the gallery for the first time, we will pull it out for them if they ask to see it, or even sometimes not. And many people simply start to weep. And in a certain sense, looking at the ghetto and looking at this painting, there is a certain sense within me of wanting to weep, of thinking of all of the devastation, all of the loss that has gone on in my lifetime, which is just a little bit shorter than yours, Sam. Hmm. So I'm gonna ask Gary, if you don't mind, to respond to the painting and then Sam, so you'll have a little more time. Yeah, and I want to circle back, if we have time, back to, uh, to the ghetto image uh, to make a, another comment about, uh, about the contradictory experience of watching or viewing uh, Sam's art. And, and, and it's this, that is, uh, and you, 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 you made the comment, Bernie, about, it, uh, about the absence of, uh, of people. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the presence of them not seen is equally powerful, right? And so, uh, so constantly I find when looking at, at artwork like this, and Sam's in particular, the, the uh, contradictory experience of, of, of seeing something just beautifully constructed, it, it, as I said earlier, it's solidity, but also full of holes. And uh, the beauty of that with the barbarity of the, of the content that's, uh, that's communicated. And so this, this contradictory uh, experience, the contradiction of life uh, lived after the ghetto in which the ghetto never goes away in some way, or those who survive never, uh, quote, surviving past the, the event, that the con contradiction seems to be a, uh, an ever-present part of, of, of Sam's uh, artwork, at least as I encounter it. Um, back, back to the family, <clears throat> uh, Rosa Vue. So if you're familiar with the Margaret Bork White famous photograph of the liberation of Buchenwald, that has the array of, of uh, um, survivor inmates behind barbed wire. I, uh, I think, uh, and what's powerful for me is the way uh, Sam reworks I iconic images, whether it's the boy from the Warsaw Ghetto, um, uh, symbols of uh, Jewish life and, and practice, et cetera. Uh, here, I see the an array of, um, human beings in various stages of composition and decomposition, um, standing in front of or behind, it's not entirely clear, one another in a way that evokes that photograph. And so the two for me <clears throat> become uh, uh, 
um, both uh, a, an experience of having seen literally somebody who's, who went through a, an experience of Buchenwald and was on the cusp of liberation. And here, the, the artwork of somebody who uh, was not in Buchenwald, but or persons who were perhaps not necessarily in, in, uh, in, in a uh, concentration camp like that, but, but who are not liberated. And that's the, the contradiction of both uh, liberation and non-liberation that, that uh, perpetually both attracts me to these images, but also pushes me away uh, in disgust. Sam, since it's called The Family. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> when I painted this painting, first thing I wanted to say with this large canvas, it's about, um, uh, as you can see here, it indicates the size of it. It's um, quite a large painting. First of all, I wanted to say it is a canvas. It is a canvas on which things are painted. And therefore, the reminder of that is in the easel that you can find here um, in the, uh, in the, on this canvas that holds a painting. And on that painting, there are uh, two women in, um, in um, kind of fashionable hats. And you can see in the face of one woman that has her eyes open, that she is blind to the reality. And this was in some way uh, an evocation of my memory of the refugees who arrived to Vilna from uh, Warsaw who were already speaking of the horrible things that were happening in, in, in Warsaw to my parents. And the Jews of Vilna in uh, that time, in, uh, when, when Hitler made an agreement with Stalin and they were not yet invaded by the Germans, were blind. Their eyes were open and they did not see. They did not see what was going to happen. And as you can see in this painting, there are more figures with um, uh, eyes that do not see. But I will not go into all the details because many of these things um, contain for, for me very uh, personal uh, meanings. But what I wanted to do is something that is, um, that is rather universal, that it does not speak only specifically of the Jewish tragedy, but speaks of humanity on the whole uh, and its enormous limitations in telling about it, speaking about atrocities, speaking about the past, and actually not being able to uh, revoke it uh, completely. And uh, giving us uh, in this kind of huge family portrait, just an idea that first of all, <laughs> in some way, uh, all humanity is this big family that has to deal with a planet that seems to li like it less and less and doesn't do anything to keep it uh, turning quietly. So um, I could go on speaking about this painting quite a lot, but I think that there are other paintings that are waiting, that are lining up. So <laughs> let's give them a chance. We will do that. I just wanted to add that, as I said to you before, a number of times people have just simply stood in front of the painting and been moved to tears um, and not tears of joy, but tears of sorrow. So if anything, it is kind of a symphony of sorrow, of recognition of the horrors that humankind seems to be able to constantly exact of others for greed, for avarice, for growth, for destruction, for expanding their own property. But at the end of the day, what remains is the memory transformed by you in a painting like this that urges all of us to somehow awaken ourselves and try to make it a bit better universe. Now on to the next painting. Um, do you want to juxtapose it with its inspiration, Rose? Is that possible? Or there you go. So Sam, I think this is a good one. Oh, actually, let's ask Gary because you, you did the um, 18 images of the melancholia as transformed by Samuel Bach. Yeah. Yeah. So you see the the melancholia on the on the left um, by by Durer and 
again, what what jumps out for me to me is uh, the the reconstituting of the iconic image. So Durer uh, was so important, became so important to the Nazis as a kind of prototypical Nazi artist, and and here. Uh, by subverting that very act, uh, you take the art and repurpose it uh, for a, a different audience in response, a political response, an, uh, a moral critique of, of uh, Durer, who lived in the uh, you know, Judenfrei Nuremberg. Um, uh, so I, I think of constantly about how icons, iconic images like a painting, Durer's painting, or or uh, icons within images, uh, like this angel, which has biblical uh, connections uh, too, reworked, uh, how they evoke um, the, the, the current way in which we put together our world without uh, even thinking about it. And that's the self-reflexive um, effect of uh, looking at uh, not only that, uh, the, the panels in front of us of canvases, as Sam said, but but what we are then asked to do in response. So are we to follow the, the um, uh, lead of this uh, repurposed angelic figure to measure out what is both uh, possible or do we strive for something that's impossible that's go that goes beyond the measure of, of, uh, of looking at the world around us and giving up uh, hope? And it's always, One's always, speaking for myself, I'm always on the cusp of an edge, a nice edge when I look at an image like this, which asks me to ask of myself, what do I mean by uh, being liberated? What do I mean by being human? What do I mean by being a, a person of faith, if, if that is, is so? So uh, again, I don't come away with this constructing uh, a narrative that has a a necessarily happy image, I'm left with a, a series of perturbing uh, questions about what I am to do. Sam? Uh, I must say that this specific uh, image by Dürer has always fascinated me. I discovered it, I think, when I was about 12. Uh, later on, I read about it uh, books. There is a famous text of Panofsky about it. and. Uh, there are so many um, uh, symbols and um, uh, it is absolutely packed with details that we do not have now the time to, dis to describe. But this angel actually is sitting there in the very uh, uh, busy composition is somehow representing a time in which Europe was supposed to go from a, a dark, from the dark ages into a world of enlightenment, the Renaissance and, and so on. And when I returned to my painting, I was, I was somehow um, trying to speak of a time in which the world of enlightenment and, uh, and the Renaissance was was returning or had returned into a time of darkness. And I have, as my answer to Mr. Um, Dürer, I have uh, painted here the angel is, uh, uh, is, is a male, while in the painting of Dürer, we don't know, it's an, it's an, it's an angel uh, and has actually no, no, no given sex. But my angel here is, 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 is a kind of a soldier is a soldier because of man's uh, duty to go on fighting and because of the concept that actually maybe war is the normal state of being and peace are only uh, privileges of small pauses between wars and so on. And it is also, of course, packed with um, Jewish um, symbols. There are the two candles of Shabbat. There is... Um, if you look in front of the soldier, there are all these uh, yellow stripes that create a yellow star, which give uh, identity to the soldier. There is also, when you can see in Dürer, this, this uh, beautiful, the beautiful uh, rainbow 
Uh, and here, my rainbow is a kind of uh, uh, a man-made rainbow where all the pieces of, uh, of, of the various colors that, uh, that uh, define our palette of, 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 of seeing things in, in, in color are uh, like, like, like shards laying on the ground. So um, uh, certainly it was a, revi a revisiting this ancient, uh, very famous engraving um, in light of what has happened to the world, uh, in what um, has happened while I, as a child, was, was, it, was a witness and, um, and the feeling that it has uh, left in me. Let me just add, if I might, Rose, and look at the piece briefly to just add a couple of notations for people who look at the painting. The um, niches where the extinguished Shabbos candles are and the smoke has pulled off the plaster reveals the bricks and the shapes of both the Ten Commandments and also the shapes of the ovens. In the foreground of that, you have tombstones, if you will, but they're also broken Ten Commandments, starting with the Aleph on the one on the right and the Vav, the Sixth Commandment, which is thou shall not murder um, on the left. And in addition, beyond the suggestion of the yellow star that Sam mentioned, outside the um, angel soldier, uh, above is a crucifix. And the soldier or the angel is seated underneath a chuppah, um, marriage canopy. So Sam has included into this particular image um, not elements of the enlightenment, the prism, the perfect sphere, rather elements of a world that has certainly been uh, fractured uh, dramatically, if not uh, almost destroyed. And in the very background on the left, a reminder of the smoke of the chimneys of the crematoria. There, there is no fire, but in the next image that we'll look at, there is fire. And it is, again, the um, use of an iconic image. Gary, you've written about this in the Icon of Loss. Um, and <coughs> as Sam in the past may have taken artwork, here he's taken uh, the photograph from the Stroop Diary, uh, image number 14 of the little boy of Warsaw and done probably upwards of 125 paintings, this just being one of them. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's a powerful revision of the uh, image of that uh, unnamed child in the um, photograph of the Warsaw Ghetto cleansing um, and repurposed here in a way that has such uh, kind of contemporary significance that uh, it, it's it's hard to it's hard to uh, to miss it. And so when when I think of the uh, this child as as uh, the the kinder right, uh, who's kindling for some purpose right, some event uh, in which he's being consumed. Uh, so on the one hand, it it suggests to me the child is passive and un unable to, to manage his own, uh, own future. And that would be true for so many children, particularly those who are uh, in, uh, in exile uh, now from their homeland, Ukraine, but also elsewhere, not just in Europe. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the child is, uh, is uh, erect. He stands. He has this uh, presence. He's, he, he commands even uh, as the flames above him uh, are consuming the wood. So I, 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 I think of, uh, again, this uh, double sense of both the possible and the impossible, the, 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 the beautiful and the barbaric, but also the, the sense of a uh, freedom that is possible to imagine if someone were to step forward and cut the, the uh, ropes that uh, bind him to, to, to the kindling. So uh, what it asks me, are you the one who's going to step forward? Uh, will you be the one who will enable the child uh, to live or will you stand back as if observing this uh, new conflagration? 
uh, and uh, and stand there weeping in sorrow. I, it, it, it demands a, a response that's more than just visual. It demands an action. Thank you. Beautifully said. Well, uh, the painting is, yeah. uh, is uh, certainly connected to the concept of the Akedah. Uh, the Akedah, which um, the, the sacrifice of um, Isaac, that uh, impressed me enormously when I was a child and I was told the stories of, um, uh, of the Bible. Um, I usually was told the stories of the Bible uh, in order to uh, have uh, my mouth open and be able to get yet another spoon of some food that I was uh, kind of uh, ha hesitating to swallow down. And, um, and this story uh, scared me terribly, but at the same time reassured me. I was sure that my father would have never, ever allowed me to burn on, 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 on some kind of an altar in order to prove anything, even the fact to, to a God that demanded uh, to um, see how uh, his father Abraham uh, would show his uh, devotion. Uh, but uh, I must say today, when I look at all my paintings, these are the paintings that really scare me because I was exactly like that boy what you, whom you see in that photograph. In those years, uh, this could have been a photograph of me and nothing would have changed in that photograph. I wear the same coat, I had the same, the same cap, my um, uh, stockings were always sliding from my, from my um, legs. Um, and strangely enough, as a child, because I have uh, uh, survived the Holocaust as a child, I had the feeling that as long as my parents are near me, as long as I'm so sure of their love, as long as I, I'm absolutely convinced that they would do anything to save me, somehow um, everything was okay. And this is why uh, I felt sick to the stomach when I heard about the children that were taken away by American uh, officers from their parents at the southern border of the United States for some inhumane administrative reasons. Um, what, what, what can I say? The children that suffer in times of war are, are the worst shame of humanity. What can I add to that? Could, you know, could I could yeah, I have one, one, one more comment? I, I, I think it was not just uh, in, in the American experience of uh, separating immigrant children at our southern borders, separating them from their children, nursing uh, babies from their mothers, toddlers from from their 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 mothers. It was not just a, a political ideological uh, act. It was also a religious act. That is the so when Attorney General Sessions justifies the uh, treatment of children uh, as he did uh, in defense of the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. He evoked the Christian letter from uh, Paul the apostle, Romans 13, to justify the way in which government uh, needs to be um, appreciated and uh, honored and followed uh, no matter what its policy. So there was this connection of both the uh, theological and religious uh, evangelical Christian belief with uh, American political um, decision making and policy. And so that's another way for me to come back to a comment you made, Sam, about the Akedah. Yes, I see this as, as the Akedah, but I also uh, think that in that uh, that important uh, chapter in Genesis, uh, the author, authors were not so clear that uh, God was going to, Yahweh was going to step in and, uh, and save. And so who is left to do that saving? Um, maybe not God at all, certainly not American authorities, it's left to us. And that's why that 
as I as I read the that rope that is beginning to unfurl on the right side, just under the left hand of the boy, has someone begun that process, or is it a failure to completely bind him up? I think that that is an invitation to me to to step forward, not for this child, but for the thousands of immigrant children that that uh, currently can't yet be placed in their families because of, of that American policy and now the millions uh, that are flooding Europe as a consequence of uh, Putin's uh, war making. Oh, absolutely. Yes. It really is so um, important, I think, for everyone who's watching to understand that although the painting may have been done in 2008, yeah. It could have been done centuries before, and it can be done again today yeah. in such a profoundly important way to ignite within each one of us the possibility of acting. A client and friend of ours, um, who is originally from Poland, is basically leaving her family here and going to set up an orphanage in Poland for children from the Ukraine and to help essentially to acculturate them and make their transition during this horrible time possible. Mm -hmm. People are on a little limited basis beginning to try to find ways because it is a new kind of activity beyond all of the formalized organizations like the Red Cross as to how do you act in a meaningful and productive way. Mm -hmm. The notion of using both artwork as an icon um, and an inspiration, or in this case, the iconic photograph, leads us to the next painting where Sam begins to uh, present a language which he has made personally his own, and I think is extremely, extremely relevant. There's a quote of Brother Thomas's that I would read that I think is quite helpful to me in any event. These ancient memories seem to remain and emerge in symbols. So Sam, I'd love it if you would talk a bit about a symbol. Well, um... I must say that um, as an artist who tries to speak about the world in which we live, the way we perceive the world and so on, uh, you have no choice. You become in a certain way a provocateur. You become somebody who wants to, to startle the, 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 the viewer, surprise. And, and at the moment of surprise, think. What does it mean? And I must say there are so many layers of the meanings of, of the pair. I mean, the pair in itself, which has this womb-like um, uh, shape for me was an inspiration of, 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 of seeing something that creates birth to other pairs. And those pairs will again give birth to other pairs. So this has something of the, of, 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 of the expression of the essence of life, life which continuously um, perpetuates itself, which in some way or another manages to survive, manages to go on. Um, there are very many layers of meaning in the pairs. I was very often asked, what do you, what do you want to say when you paint a pair? And, and I even wrote uh, a funny text about it. But um, I must say, um, just wonder by yourself about what you see, about what you cannot explain, because not everything is explainable in the world in which we live. And so many things remain mystery. And I think that one of the wonderful things in, in art is the mystery that um, is not always explainable. You just have to take it for what it is. Gary, uh, do you want to attempt the mystery or just to share some response? You know, just I would observe again the, the, the way uh, these images are uh, titled and uh, the, the play upon language that uh, invites you to think then outside of the image or beyond what the image is symbolizing about the way in which language itself uh, it, it can become a play upon itself and symbolizes something that itself is uh, not so always clear. So uh, a perpetual, uh, I don't know why you'd even need the, the first pair. If perpe perpetual <laughs> would have done it for me. Um, but I, I, I think this is, a, this is 
just a, a, a question at some point to come back to, and maybe not in the conversation today, the, the object world that becomes the, the focus of this art, um, that can only, the, the, the painting can only symbolize, it's, it's not the direct rep, rep, uh, representation or representation of the objective world outside. You're not standing before pairs painting them, but you are saying something about a world uh, whose character is open and disclosed by, by way of the image. And so the image stands in a relationship to the, the to ob objective reality that invites us not to assume that there's a direct correlation between them or there's a, the, the image is exactly representing the world, but to think about how the image itself and the world that we live in are uh, connected and reconnected by by our actions and our our, our sense of, uh, of of construction, and 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 the art helps me uh, see that process underway, right? That we are continually making the world that we're going to make of it, yet it's going to resist that that making. And how does art, in this case, of a, a pair that's reproducing itself, uh, how do how do how do we reproduce the world that we see? And what world will you reproduce? Will it be the world of, a, of burning children or will it, will it be the world of a, of a reimagined enlightenment? Um, and, and, and Sam doesn't answer that for me. And, 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 and I think Sam, you wouldn't dare answer it for me. You, you ask me to answer it for myself and, and for those that I live in love with. There is very much in this, Gary, also just an opportunity to use um, symbols or symbolic language to address all of the questions that are implicit in Sam's work. This having to do with generative behavior, one pair giving birth to others, but this is not an easy birth. These pairs are ripped out of, if you want, the mother womb or the mother pair. And then the artistic notion of a triangle, creating a sense of real stability visually in, in this landscape, gives us a sense of this could exist. So Sam creates an alternate, if you will, reality of more questions for us to engage with as we try to find our way through, I think, every day now. Um, and certainly, at, uh, I love Sam's notion that we have a little bit less time ahead of us than behind us. Hmm. Uh, how important it is to continue to engage these issues and questions and then to act upon that engagement. So we're going to uh, move um, ahead a bit um, to um, a painting from the present exhibition. Actually, if possible, we're going to skip to The War is Over, if that's okay, Rose. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, because the show was put up two weeks ago, um, and it was already in the midst of the war as it was going on, and I certainly saw this painting um, on CNN any number of times uh, and was in a sense just saddened and um, upset and angry about what somehow goes on in our world with the overarching uh, threat of nuclear destruction of the entire planet. So now people are beginning to utter the words World War III. How do you, uh, Gary, look at this painting? Sam, how do you look at it today as opposed to a week ago when we looked at it? Well, I must say, I, I always have uh, this uh, um, problem of uh, uh, from artists turn into a beholder of art. It's not simple. <laughs> so whenever I look at a painting of mine, uh, I usually look at it uh, with an idea of what is wrong about it as a painting. <laughs> and, then, and then I look at it and I ask myself, what is wrong? with the world in which we live that this painting represents. And uh, when I did this painting, actually, um, I painted it without the people that you can see there. And then I thought, how hmm. do people um, react when they see suddenly everything turned into a mess? And even, even the enormous um, uh, stacks of, of crematoria that I painted so many times that bring out clouds that are clouds 
that turn into stone because these are the tombs of which of uh, of, of people that were burned so that people don't exist the tombs will never exist but these stones somehow turn into into smoke that turns then into air and all that and even that even these horrors are in the danger of being forgotten so the forgetting of that in this messy world in which in which we live the forgetting of the horrors of the past they certainly accelerate the nourishment of the horrors of the future and and people i don't know i, I don't know what these people are are talking these people may be uh, standing there and speaking of a bar mitzvah that they prepare for a boy for next week or whatever. So um, I am I am I I was called a painter of questions, and I'm questioning myself actually all the time. I have absolutely no specific answers to things besides just sharing with what I felt when I did whatever I did. Gary. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like what uh, Sam just said about uh, the painter of questions who's invited to question himself. I, I think the same thing holds for uh, we viewers, the we, we who behold these images. That is, uh, if, we, if we see only one possibility, that is that this is the, uh, a premonition of World War III, then, um, then we may have cut short uh, the possibility that this work of art uh, invites us to think differently. For for example, those those chimneys that are spouting um, clouds are those uh, are, are those crematory? Are they are those uh, are, are those ashes from those who have been uh, uh, burned? The, the bodies that can't be buried because of the war in the Ukraine presently, or are they homes uh, home fires of people who refuse to uh, not feed their families and their children that they're they're, they're heating their homes, the, those buildings, as well as putting food on the table. Uh, and that opening in the building that um, uh, confronts us, it's a, a doorway. Uh, there's something beyond that opening uh, that in, invites uh, the question, is there more to this uh, destruction than just destruction? And are, are we to think of, uh, to go back to the opening comment, uh, of uh, Tukun, uh, are we to think about uh, ourselves as more than just the sum total of the destruction that we see in front of us? I think the artwork as a condition of being art for me is that it doesn't settle. It doesn't rest with uh, the, the worst interpretation or, or the best that we could, we could apply to it, but leaves me uh, perpetually asking of myself, is there more that I should see and that means also, is there more should I, that I should be doing? I uh, would add that um, on an earlier conversation with Sam, also one of the um, indicate, early indications of the painting was it had to do with the destruction of a planet and pollution. And suddenly we are now inundated with the pollution, not created by people through the smoke and fire and fossil fuel, but the pollution of um, human behavior, killing other people. Uh, and for what reason. So that the level of both the reality of the war, of the loss of some kind of moral center um, has enabled all this to happen. The greed that went into the building of the fortunes of the oligarchs, all that that represents and the number of them who have funded uh, programs in various countries and the country's individual institutions have become dependent on that funding. How do people take that kind of money knowing where it comes from? So Sam's paintings, at least for me, consistently change, consistently ask more uh, yeah. salient, more difficult questions to answer. I think since uh, we had wanted to include a couple of the uh, immigrant drawings at the end, why don't we do that, Rose, and then end with the continuous journey if we can, since this is only one of many continuous conversations. I, I also wanted to say that this piece speaks to a, a memory of mine, although I'm quite a youth. 
Um, I, <laughs> I have a very vivid memory of um, after the 9-11 attacks, I'm from New York and my school was in the Bronx. And um, what struck me in this piece was um, not just the toppling over of this smokestack, but one, the continuous um, smoke coming from smokestacks in the distance. And then next to the smokestack, you have sort of a cloud that looks like it's made of rock. So like this weight of, of smoke around the city. And my memory as a child was driving over the Tappan Zee Bridge across the Hudson River um, every day. And my whole family would carpool. My parents were teachers. And um, I remember seeing the smog over New York City down the river and how that stayed for months and months and months and this sort of um, heavy smoke that sort of um, affected the whole city, the whole world mm -hmm. in that area. Um, I just sort of made me think of that memory. And it continues it, to affect the whole world too. And, and, yeah. and if, I, if I could add, uh, thank you Rose for that, that comment. It, just, it, it, it underscores uh, a larger issue about reading and making sense, uh, as not just of Sam's work, but of, of, of any uh, form of art, uh, but, but especially Sam's. And that, and that is that um, once, once, it, once the brush has, has finished its work <laughs> and the viewer beholds it, uh, there's no constraint upon what the viewer uh, will see. Uh, that is, there's no limitation upon what the viewer might see uh, whether it's the the fallen falling fallen uh, building towers in New York or uh, the collapsing of um, you know a a a a, world, a global world in terms of its of, of its own health and and so the power of of an artistic representation is that it doesn't it doesn't settle with one reading and some might find that irritating and some might say, well, Sam, would you adjudicate the readings between us so that we can get the right one? And so then we can move on to the next painting because now that we have the right one, then by, by golly, we've got that settled. It's, as, it's, it's that the work, and, and I think you, you and Bernie represent this, you, you refuse to, to, to take the responsibility of making sense out of this off of the shoulders of those of us who stand before it. And that's, that's what the art and its power uh, does. That is, it holds me accountable in some important way for not just making sense of this world, but making sense of the world that I'm living in right now. It's an enormous demand, but I think a fair one, Gary, and well identified. One of the proposed names for the Samuel Bach Museum on the campus of the University of Nebraska in Omaha is the House of Questions. Mm -hmm. Rose, if we can look at the two small drawings, it would be wonderful, and then we'll move on to continuous journey. And Gary, if you would just talk about the background of these drawings and so, so briefly, these three uh, drawings were done by uh, ten and eleven year old Honduran immigrant children who had been confined in the Gallon, Texas uh, security prison behind uh, barbed wire and uh, chain link fences for a period of time. Uh, separated from their families. Uh, we, we don't know what has happened to them, at least the last that I, uh, that, that I, last report I had read that they were still looking for the, the parents of the three children. But they, they reflect um, something about the world that these children experienced. Um, for those who are not familiar, you, you should go to the internet and look for uh, photographs of, of these Texas um, um, uh, imprisonments and uh, how the children were kept in mylar, given mylar blankets, uh, uh, were forced to sleep on concrete floors, uh, not uh, given uh, toilet uh, toilets that they could use. Uh, the the stench of the air is reported by by various observers, including uh, human rights um, uh, observers. Uh, characterize this uh, in, in quite negative and, and uh, powerfully negative ways. And so this is what they have, this is what they are saying and, and showing about their world. These two uh, images are of, uh, from Ukrainian uh, 12 and 13 year old uh, children, uh, young adults now uh, on their way uh, out of the U Ukraine um, 
clearly the effort to represent tanks on the one uh, to the left. And the one to the right is a bit more challenging. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a Washington Post piece that, is, that uh, there's a link that maybe we can provide to folk that, that uh, discusses the, um, the, the children discussing their art, uh, which is a, a, a completely fascinating as, uh, as they try to put both words and image to, to the experience. The one on the right is the, the view from a train something like a kinder transport perhaps out of, out of the Ukraine into Poland and the um, uh, effort to represent three dimensionally but not quite there yet uh, forces you to have to reconstruct the, uh, the, uh, the, the train ride as, as they are seeing. Anyway, I, 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 I wanted to ask Sam um, how children's art, and it's a complex issue I realize, how the artwork produced by children um, tell the truth of their experience uh, in, in ways that uh, invite us to uh, into the image work and, and oh make... yes of course I mean art of children uh, is used very much in therapy of children because this is their way to speak their way to write their way to tell stories without that they have been taught anything these are these are very very heartbreaking images for me, uh, I uh, I see in this uh, mainly in the drawing on the right in the train how the children take with themselves their way of describing or seeing the world that they are living, because in this in these different uh, compartments of the train these are the same strokes of yellow of green or purple that describe the landscape that they are that they are living but uh, I, I i must say since i never produced <laughs> child drawings i always looked at child drawings with um, great amazement i have three daughters they have produced uh, a lot of this kind of um, expression of the world of how they see the world and the former three uh, drawings that you have shown uh, uh, brought tears to my eyes because I really remember it myself when I was in the in the in the in the in the, the labor camp in um, Hakape, mm -hmm. and um, I, I I lived with this terror of of being taken away from my parents, and um, what 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 can I say? Uh, I, I I can only tell you that. I was sick to the stomach when these things were happening here and mm -hmm. they were happening by uh, people uh, that were uh, brought to power and to the control of the administration with by by actually a, a completely blinded American electorate mm -hmm. a completely blinded uh, American electorate that so I feel in a certain way that I am co-responsible co-responsible for what happens to these children forever because these are traumatized children and 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 i very much hope that the american authorities will take care of them and will help them to go on living because we have committed a terrible crime there are really no words for what Sam has said because the sense of shared responsibility and Gary you certainly continue to uh, allude to it and press for it is that we do have these responsibilities um, this was called um, a journey into modern times the art of Samuel Bach I would say it probably is a journey into the present uh, in the art of Samuel Bach and for us to um, Amy, thank you. Thank all who attended. Um, and I think to take it as a um, urging, a cry, a crying out for each one of us to do what we can. I believe that Sam's work does um, urge every one of us to uh, sense our responsibility to a repair, whether it's a tikkun, whether it's simply reaching out to someone with an act of loving kindness but remaining constantly aware of the privilege of our lives and our responsibility to make other lives 
possible, safer, um, in a more um, honest way. So thank you, Gary, Sam, Rose, thank you for your wonderful input as well. And thanks. Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.